Welcome to July 2nd, Sunday, 2022. We're delighted those of you who are present here in our pavilion and for those who are watching us uh, from the comfort of your vacation homes, your backyards, wherever. We're, we're delighted that you can be with us. Um, our program today is Behold the Dragon Fly. And our presenters today are Corinne, Erico, and Paul Lauber. Uh, we thank uh, the Friends of Great Swamp and the Marta Heflin Foundation for their support of these programs. And at this point, I will turn the program over to Corinne and Paul uh for uh, you know and introduce yourself my name's corinne erico i'm a volunteer here um i'm not a specialist i'm not a naturalist but i love dragonflies so i've been taking pictures for years of dragonflies and damselflies we're going to do those at the end but um and getting as much information about them into this head of mine as has paul mm -hmm. paul would you like to yeah that's paul yourself? lover i've been a volunteer for about two and a half years and um, basically, I work with Kathy to get uh, speakers for Second Sunday. Today, I'm going to be one of the speakers, so different role. So thanks for all coming out. It's a beautiful day, and let's get started. Okay. First, I just do want to thank you. It's a gorgeous day. You had many other things to do. I appreciate you coming here at home and, and coming here in person. On a beautiful summer day like this, the birds are flying, they're singing, the, the um, bees are collecting pollen, they're buzzing, but the dragonflies, they're quiet. They don't make noises, so you don't hear them coming, but you do see them. They are out there, the two things that they're doing is they're getting food and they're looking for a mate. So ah. this, this is where we're gonna start the program. Let me just sit and know, sorry. Screen. Is it going to show the whole screen to them? Okay. All right. Um, the reason I chose that title is because I think dragonflies are considered a nuisance by many. They just kind of swat them away. They're not like mosquitoes, although mosquitoes have value, believe it or not. They're actually going to be food for the dragonflies, but they are really beautiful to behold. Mm -hmm. And they're sexually dimorphic. That means the boys and the girls, just like birds, look different. Here are some of the pictures that are going to be in the slideshow. On the top are the dragonflies below. I'm sorry at home, I can't, but you're going to see them on the screen, so don't worry. So I'm just going to start because I don't want to keep the stars of the show, which are the dragonflies, waiting. This is a typical dragonfly. I'm going to tell you its name later, but I just want you to see why I chose this subject. I mean, don't you think he's handsome? Oh, yes. Thank you. But when you see him, he's zipping by. He's zipping by very fast, so you might not appreciate. Fortunately, he's a percher. They're either perchers or flyers, so he's going to be on vegetation, looking and waiting, looking and waiting. What do you think he's looking for, Lucas? Does he want to eat? Yeah, Caleb says, yes, he's looking for something to eat. Uh -huh. Yes, so that's that's just because I didn't want you to have to wait. Now, scientifically, they're in the, the order of odonata, which means tooth ones. Technically, they don't have teeth, but they have sharp serrated edges inside their jaws, their mandibles. Mm -hmm. And the suborder, it's just important um, if you want to know whether it's a dragonfly or a damselfly. And... Dragonflies have unequal wings. That's why it's an anisoptera. Not important that you remember, just the wings are different sizes. The hind wings are bigger, broader at the base in the dragonfly. These are some of the overall traits that the dragonfly has. They can't, like all insects, they can't regulate their own temperature. So they have to rely upon the outside air, whatever place they're in. So that's called their echo. Up oh, in the meantime, by the way, you might have visitors up there. For those of you at home, you can't see, but a nest up in the ceiling of the pavilion, we have barn swallows making a lot of noise because they're nesting. They don't, they don't want to attend this program. 
They do want to eat dragonflies. So the real ones though. Okay. Um, they have these wonderful compound eyes. They're going to have three simple eyes to detect the, the wind speed and how close something is getting. But then they have these beautiful two, I mean, you're gonna say crazy. They look like a helmet on the face. They're that large. And dragonflies are usually touching, but they could be just close together. Damselflies are gonna be separated. Um, their vision is beyond, beyond. I'll talk about that in a minute when we get to anatomy. They have a wide body. So their bodies are wide. They hold their wings horizontally like this. Damselflies have slender bodies and they usually hold their wings like this, this or that, depending upon which kinds. They're fast flyers, but they're not the fastest flyers of all insects. Paul will talk about that later. We already talked about the size. When, when they're um, naiads, that means a nymph that's in the water. So it's specific too. So I'm gonna use that term. When they're a naiad, um, they can propel, they have gills, but they're inside their bodies. The dragonflies will be a little, the damselflies will be a little different and they can take in water and the kids will like this. And then they can shoot it out the back of their, out their backside and propel themselves forward. <laughs> Paul will talk about what they're gonna do in the water there. And the males have claspers to grab the female into a mating wheel or circle. And we'll talk about that when we get into mating. And here's, here are the different components of our show. Evolution, anatomy, you can see all the others up on the screen. Life cycle, mating, predator and prey, aerial acrobats, dragonfly flam families, the ones you're gonna see here at the Great Swamp. Then we're gonna go into damselflies. If we have enough time and I don't bore you to tears, you can always say enough, enough, enough. I will not take offense. <laughs> And then we'll show you pictures because they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, would you like to start okay. on evolution, yeah. please? A little advantage right here. Yeah? You just ready to mm -hmm. this. Oh, sorry. That's nope. down, okay. down, down, down. Just that okay. All right. Dragonfly evolution. So we're going to go back 325 million years to the Carboniferous period through 245 million years ago. And the fossil record shows us Proto Donata. And these are all known as griffin flies. This is the largest insect ever known. And our props department put this together. Um, <laughs> let's see if <laughs> this I put together. And this is the biggest insect ever. So there's a lot of different information about they were a foot long or two. This, this I got from a book from the London, the Natural Science Museum of England, three and a quarter feet, one meter. And this body would be 16 inches long. So when you see TV shows or movies where they're like eight feet across, this is the biggest insect that I've ever been. Um, so they're called griffin flies. They were uh, only distantly related to the Odonta today. We'll, we'll tell you why. And the question is, why were these guys so large? Anybody have any ideas? Carboniferous period? George. Oxygen, George. Very good. Oxygen. The atmosphere was 35% oxygen. If that during this time period. Today, it's only 21%. And for some reason that impacted insects. This wasn't the only large insect. There were, there were lots of them that got ridiculously large. Uh, there are also no predators. There were no dinosaurs there were no birds, obviously. Um, and what caused their downfall? Uh, well, nature doesn't like a huge body design. That's, that's number one. Oxygen did fluctuate. So that impacted them, probably made them sluggish. And the first dinosaurs appear about 245 million years ago. Also, the backdrop on this is the Permian extinction. That's where 70% of terrestrial species, 95% of marine species, uh, pretty much were wiped off the planet Earth. That was related to volcanic activity. Um, and 250 million years ago, the first true odonata appears in the fossil record. And these guys have what they call a pterostigma, the tip of each wing and they have a notice in the middle of each, uh, the, the edge of each wing. And that makes them true dragonflies. And we'll have more on that later. There's a picture, great picture of a fossil from back then. Uh, this is a griffin fly. Pretty amazing that these things could be going back again uh, between 320, 250 million years ago. And then 200 million years ago, the true Odonite families still found today in the fossil record, they start to appear. They were a lot more diverse back then. There were quite, quite a few more, but again, that's all part of the evolutionary process. So Odonata today um, 
5,200 species worldwide. Some books say 55, but the best that we could find was 52. North America has 447. Um, and interesting, 447 species divided by 5,200 is 8.6%. Any birders in the house? I know there are. I know you're out there. How many worldwide species of birds? 3,000. How many? 3,000. 10,000, correct. How many in North America? 900. Just about 900. So again, that 9% relationship holds up, which I found thought was pretty interesting. Um, it gets more interesting though in New Jersey. We have 183 species, 130 dragonflies, 53 damselflies. Now, New Jersey is the fourth smallest state. We've got Rhode Island, Connecticut, Delaware are smaller. Who wants to guess in the ranking from high to low, where does New Jersey rank as far as the number of species of damsels and dragonflies? One? I like the way you think, George, but that's not correct. <laughs> Two? Nope. Correct answer is fourth. So we're the fourth small state, but we got the fourth highest amount of dragonflies and damselflies. We only get beat by Texas, Virginia, and New York. And New York is only 10 ahead of us. So, um, And by the way, this, Texas is 25 times bigger uh, geographically than New Jersey. So those other states are five and six times bigger. Um, so Sussex County, this is real, a real anomaly. There's 142 species recorded in Sussex County. And it's the most of any county in the United States. Um, Sussex County is only 536 square miles, and there are counties like San Bernardino County, California, 20,000 square, biggest in the country, 20,000 square miles, 37 times bigger than Sussex. So basically, when you go through all these numbers, what do they mean? It means if you were to kind of like take a hot air balloon from here to High Point, you'd be going over really like the odontic capital of North America. So it really is unique, it's the area that we live in. Yeah. All right. And now we're gonna talk about the anatomy, um, just so that as we go along and we use terms like Paul just used the term notice and terror stigma, you'll see where that is on a body. So the most important part isn't to memorize all these. All, like all insects, there are three body parts. There's the head, the thorax and the abdomen. The head is amazing because of the eyes. They dominate the body, the, the whole body. And so far proportion, look at the size of the head. They say it's like I said, a football helmet. They have the simple eyes, they have the compound eyes. Within each eye, and I brought these just to give you an idea, the hexagon type facets that are the covering of, of the photoreceptor lenses. I don't want to show you. Sorry. There's, I don't know if you can see how, but if you spin this, you can see, and I'm gonna pass them around one on each side, please. Paul, would you mind giving one to this side, one to that, and then just pass them over. Their vision is amazing because they, louder? Yeah. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm shouting, so I'm so sorry to those if I have been too quiet. They have 30,000, photoreceptors in each eye. They're gonna take all of those images and they're gonna get a great picture. They can see almost 360, but they can't see behind them, which is they, why they say, if you wanna sneak up on them there. I actually try to lock, it, lock them in because they can assess me very quickly, decide whether I'm going to be a predator or bother them. As of course I have very slow movements. So I was able to take these pictures by being very still, watching their eyes because their eyes are in constant motion. Um, the other thing about their eyes is 80% of their brain power is focused on vision. That's amazing. Now, because of that super, super trait, that's a superhero trait, their vision, they don't rely on some of the other senses that you think they're not rely on, relying on smell. Some say they don't smell at all. They do have antenna, but they're very short. That will tell them the wind speed um, and again, how close things are, but it's not factoring in hugely, although the literature changes decade by decade where they say, aha, they put them in a room and maybe they did respond to smell. That hasn't been validated again. And also I should preface all my statements by telling you everything we're telling you, we picked up from the literature, not being naturals ourselves, 
However, it's conflicting information. So whether it's 350 million years ago that the Griffin Fives lived or 300,000, whether it was 100,000 before the dinosaurs, those are relative terms. So if I, if I misspeak, forgive me, I'm just quoting somebody else. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it up. So mostly it's the eyes on the head and the mouth. The mouth is gonna be different in the, the larvae when they're in the water and when they're an adult. So right now you're looking at the adult. I'll show you what the, what the, um, the larvae looks like insofar as his jaw. So they've got the, the upper lip and the lower lip and the lower lip is called the labium. Again, later you'll see it, but they're gonna use this with inside their jaws. They're gonna be chewing, not true teeth, serrated things, but you, if you were to be bitten by one, you would say it felt like a tooth. To me, it felt like a bite. It, it is a bite. Um, so that's the, that's the, those are the most important things about the, the head. Then the thorax, the thorax is like this power source. Um, it's, it, everything's there. It's got the six legs attached to it. It has two pairs of wings. Paul's going to talk about how these wings can move up and down, this and that. They're cover, covered with, as, as insects are, chitin, but I thought it was pronounced chitin. It's chitin. It's C-H-I-T-I-N. I say that because I had to look up half of the pronunciations to make sure I was scientifically correct. But in its pure chitin is, is transparent, but it, it will strengthen the outside, the exoskeleton of, of this particular insect. Um, the wings, the notice. Can you see the notice, that little notch in the middle? Oh. I don't have the pointer, so I'm just going to say, do you see that tiny? Let me see if I can do it from here. Okay, here. All right, here's the notice. Mm -hmm. That brings flexibility. These, they're going to maneuver all around. Every wing is operating independently. The stigma or pterostigma up here is towards the end of the wing, and that's going to provide stability. Remember, these are flying insects, so this is very important. Everything, like I said, is generated from here. The, the thorax is going to, uh, there are muscles in those wings, by the way, out towards the edge, um, so they can do there. There are muscles in the thorax. It's going to control the leg movements, the head movements and the wing movements. So again, power source, most important thing. It's attached, the head and the thorax are attached by a thin thread-like uh, attachment, a, a thin thread. So as it's attached, you will see in some of the pictures or maybe not, or because their heads are relatively large, they're going to take those front wings, by, uh, legs, by the way, the legs are slanted forward, they're going to actually hold their heads. I didn't find that out until I was in Florida and looking up a, 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 a skimmer there. At any rate, but that, that helps them. That helps them otherwise, you know. The wings are usually horizontal. One book said that they only do that so they're on the alert. If they're resting, they may droop them down. And then when they're flying, they do all kinds of crazy things, as you will see, as you will see. Um, and then you reach the abdomen. There are 10 segments. This is really helpful for identification mm -hmm. because there might be different markings on the different segments. At the end are the sexual organs. Well, actually there's a secondary sexual organ for the male there, not the primary. And this, they're gonna be claspers. Circe is the, is the term for the pair. And that helps in the mating, the male, we're going to, should we get to the mating? Or first, let's, let's see. Let's do the life cycle because those are the important parts that you, does anybody have a question about any parts or want to know any more? Okay. So here's the life cycle. And this was the chicken or egg. Do I start with the adult or, and, and show their mating? Or do I start with the egg? I chose to start with the egg. The dragonflies are going to lay hundreds to thousands of eggs in the water. They could be round, spherical. They could be oblong. Sometimes they're in masses, sometimes they're not. She's going to deposit them in the water, sometimes with the male in attendance, sometimes still attached to behind her eyes, um, mm -hmm. sometimes far off, sometimes do whatever you want. You know, it's whatever. 
I guess it's not that dissimilar to sometimes humans. Um, the nymph, by the way, they're showing you, I don't know why they do this, but often in the literature, they're gonna show you a damselfly. So even though it might look like the body, the end of that, those caudal lemo, lemo how do I say that, George? Lem, lemonella, the, the, the gills, they have out external gills on a damselfly. Their gills are inside, so they're breathing inside. Paul's going to tell you what they do in the water. It's amazing. We're going to show you something. And then they're going to molt. They're going to molt anywhere between 9 and 17 times. Yeah. That's because their bodies have to grow. They have to get bigger. And so their skin's too tight. Think of the butterflies and the, you know, as they go along. However, there's not another stage. They're not going to have a chrysalis. They're not going to have the pupa as its turn. And then they're going to turn into the adult dragonfly. When it comes out, and this is what they do, they'll climb on a rock or vegetation out of the water. After, by the way, it's a period, it could be weeks, months, up to five years. It depends on where they are, what the environment is like. Um, it's crazy. The migrating ones, actually, because they're successive generations, they're gonna be pretty quick. Like especially the globe skimmer that you're gonna see. That has to find a pool quickly turn into, into an adult mate, go along, go to the next stage, you know, so they're different things. But if they're staying here and most dragonflies that we're gonna be talking about, a lot of the skimmers are just gonna be here. They're gonna be in the water, overwintering in the water, how long depends on the outside climate. Mm -hmm. So that's what they look like. Now I told you, this is what in the water looks like, the mouth part. You see that labium? that he holds it like this over his face. He'll hold it over his face until he spots prey. Then I, the only comparable thing I could think of was a Pez dispenser. He's gonna shoot it out. He's gonna shoot out this labium and grab the prey. Paul will tell you what kind of prey he's gonna grab. So that part is very different in the adult. It's just the lower lip. It is used for chewing and all that, but he- um, oh, a Pez dispenser, as you know, it's going <laughs> to shoot out. So that would be the labium shooting out. Silly, silly. I work with kids a lot. <laughs> Can you tell? And then here, oh, Laurel, thank you, Laurel at home. Our wonderful Laurel, who makes everything happen, saw this and I brought in her picture. And she was kind enough to also show what happened. This is the last molt. When it leaves it on the vegetation or the rock in this particular case, it's called an exuvia. It's the last molt, the last skin of the dragonfly. And you see him coming out. When he comes out, he's gonna be a tenoral. I'll say it's a very tentative existence because he's vulnerable. His wings haven't hardened. He, he can't fly very, I mean, he might crawl out and, and, and by the way, they don't crawl very well because they're forward moving. Um, this is, I'm so sorry at home. Can you see these two? This is one Laurel found. If I take it out, let's see. And then I found one the other day. Now you'll notice that even though dragonflies over here and in the slides are gonna be colorful, they lose their color. The minute they're, they're gone, they shrink. You won't see much, but if you later wanna look at it, you'll see that the wings are so, the wing on the last stage are so tiny because they haven't been pumped up and developed just as the monarch of when it's at the beginning, it has to send things out. So here are two samples of that. This was hanging, this poor guy is gonna break. This is the other one, if you can see it. Where's the screen? There, that. And then I took a picture of an emerging dragonfly. I was lucky enough to see this uh, at another pond. And both of them, I don't know if you noticed, but look at that little white thread. I found that interesting. I'm thinking it's like, was that a um, umbilical cord or something, you know, attaching from the, from the, the last one to this, it's on laurels too. See the little white? Yeah. Again, interesting. I don't have a name for it. I didn't look that up. There's too much information to look up every, yes. every piece. Now here's a tenoral. You see how uh, 
glimmering it is. They have transparent wings, but they're super, they're, it's like cellophane. And again, they need hours to days. 80% of these tenorals are gonna be eaten. So they better, hard, they better find a spot where nobody else is looking for them. Mm -hmm. And then mating. I am gonna simplify this as much as possible. <laughs> The, the male has a secondary organ at the end of his abdomen. That's where he keeps a sperm packet. He stores his sperm there. He, in advance of mating, he's going to transfer that up to the area where he has his primary sexual organ, a penis, and, and it's going to be ready for mating. He's going to be, he, so it, let's say he's ready, locked and loaded. He's ready to go. So the female, he's going to find a female. Meanwhile, by the way, he's been flying around a pond competing for the best spot. The best spot is what they call a rendezvous. It's got, it's, it's a super, super term. We know what a rendezvous, a get together place. Um, so he's going to try to get all the other dragonflies away. Like choose me, choose me, choose me. The female may mate with several, but she's going to look for a strong and sometimes his colors are gonna be an indication. Again, because they have vision, by the way, they can see 30 different um, pigments. They also have, they can see ultraviolet light and they can see light that reflects off water, polarized. So they can really discern, you know, say relative health. So the female assesses, okay, now I'll go to your rendezvous. Cause she might be just lurking in the background, waiting for somebody to say, okay, I've got the spot, come meet me. She comes. He's going, he's, he might do this in the air. He might do it down here, but he's going to grab her with his claspers behind her eyes to make sure she stays with him. It doesn't, she's not distracted by the other guys flying around. No, 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 you're, you're with me. You're my partner. And it's called a lock and key um, arrangement so that they don't mate with the wrong ones. Although apparently there are some, but they don't know if the offspring are sterile. So let's just say for the most part, they mate with the same species. And so there's there. And now he's got up here is his primary sexual organ. Down here is her sexual organ. She has to bend it up and come in contact and then take, he's going to transfer the packet to her. She's going to accept it. While he's there, he might say, hey, wait a minute, I see some packets from some other boys. No, 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 I only want my children to come out. So he can clean that out. Some have a, a particular different, to, yeah. But again, this is just, I don't want to get too much. So let's just say the transfer is effective. She will not, um, those eggs won't be fertilized until she decides to lay them. Usually, let's think about the ones who don't stay, who don't stay attached and don't go to the water. You'll see her tapping the water. Let's say there's a male and he says, I don't want any part of it. Well, as she's flying off, here comes another dragonfly that might say, okay, fine. And that's how you can get more than one sperm packet within there. She can delay it. Again, it might even depend upon the weather conditions. Weather is very important to them. So then they affect the transfer. They go to the, a body of water. They're going to tap, tap, tap. She's going to have hundreds or thousands of eggs. So you'll see he's either hovering nearby, attached to her, or or whichever. We haven't decided which because it depends on the species. And now we're going to what do dragonflies okay. eat, and who eats them? Paul? All right, let's and eat we have some. Oh yeah, we got all here. kinds of things here, but um, when you tell me okay. That, yeah, you can go over there and do the props. We're big on props here today. Yeah. Um, yeah, I work with you. What did the dragonflies eat? So they're totally carnivores, right? They totally eat meat, and they actually do cannibalize each other. Um, they'll cannibalize in both stages, in the aquatic nymph stage and in the adult uh, phase as well. But the aquatics are voracious. Um, if you go on YouTube and you check some of these uh, clips that are out there, it looks like something from a science fiction horror film, like Alien or something. <laughs> These, uh, they will eat mosquito and beetle larvae, which is a good thing. They eat worms, but they even eat tadpoles. And with that uh, labium we talked about, that Corinne talked about, even small fish. And you'd be shocked about how big these fish are relative to um, these naiads. And again, they're eating this fish while they're alive. So check that out on YouTube. The adults are also notorious hunters. They can eat 20% of their body weight daily, and they'll go after basically anything bigger than they are. 
uh, I'm sorry, smaller than they are, such as mosquitoes, midges, butterflies, moths, bees, flies, gnats, mayflies, and as I said, other smaller dragonflies and damselflies. Um, they tend to prey on things that are airborne. So if, again, if you're a birder, think about like a peregrine falcon going after a duck or a dove, and they're extremely efficient hunters. Um, some say 90% is the kill rate. Some are even as high as 95%. Um, and again, through evolution, this is from like about 200 million years on, they really developed the perfect body form for aerial predation. Okay. Then what eats dragonflies? So dragonflies in the Great Swamp in particular, and Bryn's going to show a lot of great pictures of dragonflies from the Great Swamp. They live in a very dangerous world because just about anything that lives by the water is gonna to try to eat them. And number one among those would be the birds. And you can see the categories. Flycatchers, pretty obvious what they do. And they do it well. And we've got eight species that breed right here in the Great Swamp. So whether you're talking Phoebe, which you always see a picture of Phoebe with the dragonfly, uh, Peewee, least flycatcher, Acadian, Willow, Alder, Eastern Kingbird, and the Great Crested Flycatcher. Caleb's gonna show one of the birds that eat. The dragonfly, the one that's been flying here for these weeks, so they can do a sound. All right, very cool. Okay, look at one of the animals. We have a whole front. I don't know if you can hear that. The whole front. And then another baby sound. We've got another swallow, and they're in the box. There. Those are tree swallows. Thank you. All right. Very good. So the uh, flycatchers, uh, falcons, kestrels and merlins. If you go down Pleasant Plains Road, you'll often see a kestrel with a large falcon. Um, swallows. We got plenty of those. We got tree swallows here. We have barn swallows, rough wings. And right out there, we've got the purple Martin condominiums out there. And they're always filled. Yeah. And flycatchers. This is an eastern king. Okay. Almost always on the tree back there. That's kind Sally of an eastern kingbird. Okay. Hey, terminal <laughs> band. It's an eastern kingbird. That King is, okay. Bird. That's legit. Tiny sound. That's an eastern kingbird. And even chimney swifts and e even kingbirds. Uh, in the research, we found even, even kingbirds. Kingfishers, I should say, will eat uh, dragonflies. And those are just the birds. Um, fish, obviously, will will go after dragonflies, especially as Corinne mentioned, when they're dropping the eggs, they're, they're skimming the water. Um, and also the, feet, the fish will eat the aquatic nymphs. Um, Frogs will eat the aquatic nymphs, and any dragonfly is like caught in a rainstorm and he lands in the water. Once his wings are in the water, he can't get out. And then, of course, he's susceptible to frogs and fish. Um, larger insects and larger dragonflies, uh, wasp and praying mantis be an example of that. And even smaller mammals, shrews, muskrat, anything basically that's near the water. Um, turtles, and even not, not so much in the Great Swamp, but Carnivorous plants, if you get down into the pine barrens, just start looking at the pitcher plant, sundew, um, further south, Venus fly traps. Dragonflies is, is pretty meaty. So, you know, it's a, it's a good thing for these types of carnivorous plants to go after. So, like, again, they live in a pretty dangerous world. Okay. There's a classic picture of the Eastern Phoebe with the dragonfly. And the next category is about their flight characteristics. So they're, they're famous for their acrobatics, their aerial acrobatics and their agility. Uh, dragonflies are really unique. They can propel themselves up, down, backward, forward, side to side, and they can hover in midair. Uh, they have two sets of independent wings that are strong, flexible, and powered by those large uh, thorax muscles. Uh, the stigma, pterostigma on the wings serve as a weight to prevent vibration and stabilize flight. And you're going to see every picture you see, you're going to see that stigma on the dragonfly. Incidentally, in the 1980s, the aircraft industry started putting the winglets on the end of the, the planes. So the dragonflies kind of figured that out 250 million years ago. So not too bad. Um, each wing can do different things. Each can adjust their, their shape and their angle. And... Uh, one can stop while the others are, are still moving. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. And they also exhibit something called motion camouflage, which I had never heard of, um, but it's kind of interesting. This was this, not really discovered. They say discovered in 1995. It was really kind of named in 1995. And these were scientists studying hoverflies. Um, and basically motion camouflage deals with the, the, the ability to conceal, or 
Motion camouflage provides concealment for a moving object. It enables an attacker to approach a target while appearing to remain stationary from the target's perspective. So think of, from a non-nature standpoint, if you've ever been on a railroad track that's completely straight, and you see an engine way off in the distance and nothing else, and you don't know if it stopped or if it's moving, if it's moving, is it moving fast, is it moving slow? That's kind of the idea. So it would come at you, and of course you would be able to say, okay, uh, it's looming larger, right? So you can say it's coming towards me. However, if it's going super fast, which these dragonflies can do, it could be on top of you in an instant because the background, nothing changes in the background. That's the idea behind motion camouflage. Other animals exhibited too. Uh, they found that uh, peregrine falcons, in addition to dragonflies, also some bats do that as, as well. Um, we talked about how that applies to them. And the next would be, oops. Oh, okay, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped the speed part. So dragonflies can go 22 to 30 miles an hour. Uh, they have an average cruising speed of 10 miles an hour. And this is what's interesting as it relates to the motion camouflage. They can fly 100 body lengths forward in one second, uh, only three body lengths backwards in a second. But you can imagine how quickly they can come up on their prey with their ability to do that. Again, it goes back to why they're like the ultimate kind of predator. Okay, the last thing we want to talk about is migration. Uh, not too much on this, but basically it's not fully understood by science. If you read about insects in particular, birds, everyone's studying birds, but when it comes to insects, they kind of play second fiddle, um, but they do migrate. They have the powerful flight allows them to cover very large distances. Uh, most long range migrants have an expansive hind wing. Uh, this is the back wing, it's broader. Well, they're, they're always bigger on the back, but these ones are particularly bigger which increases the surface area and lift and enhances the gliding. This is really no different than say like a blood winged hawk that's migrating in the fall. Uh, monarch butterflies use the same idea. They'll wait for a Northwest wind or a thermal and then they'll ride that as they move south. Uh, in North America, 16 species migrate, about 5%. The famous one is the common green darner. This is the big giant one you usually see in September. Uh, they're found in North and Central America, China. Eastern Siberia, and they migrate basically like a lot like birds just to avoid the cold. And the other one, the international one, is the wandering glider, also known as the globe skimmer. This is uh, found on all continents except Antarctica. They've been known to travel 1,200 miles, and they have like a multi -gener generational kind of migration, much like the monarch butterfly. Anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, we're getting close to pictures. So. Yeah, sorry. We didn't want to keep you waiting too long, but we also wanted you to understand the dragonfly, what he can do, who, what he eats, what, who, eats, who eats him, et cetera. So now we're getting into the families. I'm going to show you the families that we're talking about here. You've got the skimmers that are large to, to, to wait a minute, I can't even read that. Small to large, right? And they're going to include, I'm going to show you the names of the ones that are at the swamp. They're, the, they're gonna be the most prevalent. You're gonna see more of them. Darners are medium to large, like the common darner that uh, Paul was just talking about. We also have swamp darners. You're gonna see, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I have a question. I don't sure. know if uh, you wanna go into detail on it, but I was curious about the uh, Northwest Wind Darner. What is there about New Jersey <laughs> that causes there to be so many dragonflies? And what's specific about <clears throat> counties in Broadway? Well, Paul so, was talking about yeah, that before. So everything I read, it's really about the water. So if you read about dragonfly conservation, it's all about keeping the water clean, keeping the watershed clean, which is not breaking news, right, for all kinds of species. But for dragonflies in particular, that seems to be the reason. And again, we're not experts on this. And I, I have the same question. Why would it be such an anomaly? But we think it's because there's, there's obviously the habitat, but a lot of it deals with a lot of clean running water making its way to the Delaware. And Morris County as well, you know, it's not too far behind. It has like 125 spe species. So all these counties, Passaic, Sussex, Morris, and Warren, in the, they call them like the, the northern high, Northwestern Highlands. These four counties all have 100 species or more. So it's really is truly unique when you start looking at, you know, other states. Like Alaska has 35 in the entire state of Alaska. 
but that speaks more to them being northerly. But even in like Virginia, New York, and in Texas, it's they have more species, but they're way more spread out. We have that concentration that makes our area so unique. Thank you. That was a good question. Um, these are the different families. I'm going to show you examples of each. I'm going to show you many more skimmers than any of the others. If there's a picture here and it has a different attribution, that's because somebody else took it. The rest are mine. So here are the skimmers that we see. These are just the names, but they're they're very evocative. I think you know, there again many skimmers, white tail gliders, saddlebags. So let's take a look at them. Here, the one who was on the poster, this is the blue dasher. This happens to be the male. He's blue. The female's going to look different. I'm just putting different things down here, but I don't want you to have to worry about that. But I do want you to notice the general, just as they say, the, the shape, the size, et cetera. He's about 1.4 inches. That's an average. There are definitely some that are smaller, and you'll see the larger blue dashers going after the males. They're probably the most common. If you go to the um, Wildlife Observation Center on the sportsman blind there, they're the first ones you're going to see. They're plentiful. You won't see that many females because, again, she's going to come later. She's going to wait till they do get out. And like, who's the strongest? Who's the handsomest? And then she'll come along. So um, you can. So things that if you're if you're trying to take a picture, I would suggest you take the picture and then you can go to a guidebook. The simplest guidebook is this one. If we don't have it now, you can order it. It's the beginner's guidebook. I use this all the time. And while I'm not a naturalist, I don't consider myself a beginner, but it's a, I find information in here that maybe I overlooked the first time. Very condensed, very good pictures. So there's the male. He has black wings. Those eyes are, I think, stunning. His face right here, the fronds is, the, is, is um, whitish, blue abdomen. And then he has a black abdominal tip there. The last segments are. Here's the female very different looking she's she's got reddish eyes she's got the yellow on her and i can and she's usually comes near the water when there and then here's what she looks like from above i'm sorry so they can see you so okay okay sorry so as you can see what's happening here is the colors of dragonflies may change as they age we'll talk about Ruinosity in a little while, but right now her eye color is going to be changing to a green. But you'll notice on her abdomen, on the segments, she's got those um, carrot like uh, diagonally forward back. Um, oh, I can't, I call it triangles. And then here they are mating. And we talked about that before. She has to bend forward, take the, take the sperm packet, and then fly off. She's probably going to hold her because he doesn't want anybody else coming along. Here's another one that I'm just seeing more of right now. Sometimes they come in different times of the season, even though they may have been here, there are more Eastern pond hawks now. The male will start off looking like the female. He's gonna be green, um, but then as he ages, he's going to change. So she's gonna always stay green. So you'll know it's a female. And you'll also, if you see them in a wheel or the heart, you know which is which. The one being grabbed is always the girl. The one doing the grabbing is always the guy. And here's here's a, um, the male as he's progressing. The one I saw the other day, you see how there's green right in that section past the thorax onto the first part of the abdomen? In the one I saw, it had already turned blue going up and there was just a trace of green by the thorax, right? Those little connections there. Then there's another one that you might say, is this similar to the blue dasher? Can somebody tell me a difference from the blue dasher that we had a minute ago? I'll go back to that for a second. There's the blue dasher. And then here's the great blue. He looks different, doesn't he? Yes. Yes, different, right? The thorax is, is the same color as the abdomen there. Also the, the stigmas out there are dark. You have to see it in person to see how dark they are because they're appreciably dark. And she, so he's got more markings there. And his eyes, 
Uh, they don't really have so much green, although you could say turquoise blue is green as well, but there's less green. And here's the female. Doesn't look anything like the male, except for the remarkably dark uh, tips of the wings right mm -hmm. there. She's really striking and they're larger. So they're gonna be larger than the other, but th remember these are also skimmers. So they're perchers. So you get a good chance to see them. Then you've got, Paul was talking about the globe skimmer or the wan uh, wandering glider. This is the one that can go 1200 miles from the, that's not all of them on all the different continents. We have them, this was off the boardwalk in, at the uh, Great at the Wildlife Observation Center. The one in the first one, past the kiosk to the left. Um, you can see the stigma, they're kind of brownish red. You can see the body and look at the, the markings down the back of the abdomen. And this one is the reason it can, can go so far. It'll start in East Africa, the longest one. By the way, they track that. Think how tiny these are. Most dragonflies are two to five inches, okay? They tracked it by putting these micro uh, radio receptors, transmitters, and they attached it with, what do you think they could use as an adhesive? Yep. And also, and I don't, I, can't imagine because I wouldn't even yeah. put it on my own eyes, but I eyelash adhesive. So those are the things that they did. And and they watched, and that's how they knew that it it stopped, went to a new pond. You know, they laid the eggs, new generation came and all. And again, tracking that had to be incredible, but they did it. So this is the world, world traveler, except for Antarctica. And there's a spot wing glider. And I was thinking, okay, so. Where are the spots? If you look right, that is my, how do I get, how did I get that before? Sorry, I'm trying to get, oh no, I don't want you yet. At any rate, the, look at the um, back wings, the hind wings, and then look at that dark spot. You can just make it out. If he were fully extended like this, you, you see two dark brown spots. Those are actually the spots they're talking about. But again, he looks very different than the other skimmers. So you're going to notice that. Just take a picture, enjoy, or don't take a picture and just enjoy. You don't have to take pictures. And here, I'm going to show you, you're saying, okay, why is he called a whitetail? Well, this is the immature. I saw so many of these in April and I'm like, wait a minute, where are the adults? Well, duh, they have to you know, age. So they start out like this. They've got these big patches. See the big broad patches there? And then black across from thorax out here bars. And then you notice those little triangles or dashes on the side. That's going to be important later when it gets confusing. So that's the immature male. Oh, sorry, went the wrong way. He's going to get something. The one thing that's going to make him a whitetail is pruinosity. It's a chalky wax-like sub uh, substance that's going to be on his abdomen. And you'll see in a middle, middle. There, there he is. That's the same one you just saw, except now he's older. You can see in this picture, there are tiny white triangles down the sides of his abdomen, but you might not see them. It's good, it could blend in with the, with the uh, chalkiness. And then here's the female. Now, you wanna see the immature male compared to this? Tell me what's different. Here's the immature male. Here's the adult female. Yes, right, those big bands. I always think of a box kite for the adults with, with those big broad bands. This one has patches. It's gonna get a little more confusing in a minute because there's another one that's gonna be very similar. But remember, these dashes are diagonal on the abdomen. The next one that's going to be confusing with, not just yet, this is a beautiful 12 spotted skimmer. Notice the white in between the segments. So there are gonna be 12 dark spots and then the white in between. Here comes the female. She's got dark spots, but no white, but there's something on, can you see the side of her abdomen? Does she have triangles or lines? 
lines. That's right. So that's the way you're going to be able, to, there is another way too, but that's the most readily visual clue that you're going to get. That's, that is not um, a common whitetail female. But you see how it can get confusing, which is why I say take your pictures, because then you can go home and go, I thought I had this, but I actually had that. Trust me, I've done this a million times. I'm still looking up pictures. I have a box. I have one album of, huh? What are they? <laughs> so really. Oh, thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's again, like when I do the birds, it's the species, not me. It's just, I'm trying to capture something. Now here's a beautiful male widow skimmer. What do you see on his wings that stands out? Pardon me? It's like a, it's a dusty blue. A right, it's, it's whitish actually, but you're right. It does look like it can't, blue and white look very similar. Sorry, the barn swallow really wants us all to leave, but sorry. <laughs> um, so that's the male. And then here's a gorgeous female. What's she missing? Can you see something that's missing on her that, that you talked about before somebody who hasn't? I'll go back to the male. Here's the male. And here's a, yes, any, just, I just want some people who haven't spoken. Sorry. <laughs> it's great that you know the answer. So that's super. Um, so she, again, and she's, she looks golden. The, the yeah. abdomen looks golden in the sun. She's just stunning. It's hard not to, that's why I said, you know, behold. Yeah. It's hard not to be impressed. Oh, and this, <laughs> this, was just off by the, again, past the kiosk at the Wildlife Observation Center. And that's where I found this one. He's striking. He's, there's nobody like him. So I don't have to say what's different about him. You can, you can just tell. And then female, much paler. Oh no, my dragonflies are going away. And that's, sorry, I don't, one belongs to Laurel. We saved it, Laura, don't worry. So there you go. Again, another beautiful dragonfly, still pretty, more yellow than gold or orange. Here's this lady skimmer. Again, another common one. The most prevalent ones you're gonna see are those blue dashers. Then, then the pond hogs, cause they've been coming around and this lady skimmers are there too. Um, it's kind of like a blue black on him. Sometimes he can look all black, but it's blue-ish. That's where you get the term slady. There's the male, female doesn't look anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, she's closer in appearance to the um, great blue skimmer that you see up there, but she's a different, she's just different. And there they are mating, so you can see. Then you know you have the right, then you know you've got the right female when you see it with the male, because you can identify the male first. That's another kind of cheap little shortcut, how you know. Yeah. And then, oh my gosh, I saw my first of this season because they come later in the season. These are the meadow hawks. They say that you can only identify if you have it in hand. I got these pictures and you can see one seems to have the red face. The other seems to have a straw colored face. Sometimes it's the, the um, sun on it. So I'm not gonna tell you that's definitely a ruby Meadowhawk on the left and the cherry faced on the right. Mm -hmm. But I am going to tell you, I think they are. <laughs> but enters the third confusion. There is also a white faced. We can't see his face. If it's white and not straw, it's going to be your white faced. Again, have fun or say, I don't care, you're a meadowhawk. That's the <laughs> other thing that you can do. And that's fine. Never feel like, you need to know specifically, or the Latin name. We're very lucky in the United States, we don't, they identify uh, dragonflies and damselflies, all the odonata uh, with, with a common name. So you don't have to memorize, but you go to Europe, you better you better know the Latin <laughs> binominal. Yes. This is the one that we play, this is the one we get in December. Oh, yes. Yeah. Paul has seen the, well, did you see the I next saw, one? I don't know which is the, or did you I, see I, these? I, I think it was that. Okay. I'm not positive, but it was definitely red. December, which is crazy yeah. when you think how late that is. But yeah. there, yeah. As late as December 6th. December 6th, Paul saw that. 
at the WOC. WOC, yeah. And they're usually on the boardwalk or on, on the uh, railings over there. They definitely want the sun because the climate is changing um, for them by then, by then it's cooler. And they're mating all the time that they're here. So you see, I don't know if he is going to be taking her to the water or saying, come with me. You know, I mean, I don't know at what stage of mating they are, but he definitely is attached to her. And then here they are. Now you know, now you know he wants to make sure when she deposits her eggs that he's the only one. He's the one and only. And then there's a dot tailed white face. As you can see, here's the dot on the tail and here's the white on the face. Um, I saw this at the sportsman's blind maybe four years ago. And I was like, I've never seen you before. So I'm definitely taking a picture. That's why I do these. And then there's a black saddlebags. This is the female, the male's comparable. It's, they look like they're carrying a violin case on their body. And there's gonna be a Carolina, there's gonna be a red saddlebags. They're, they're obviously gonna be red, um, but that little patch in, in between where the scales are worn off, that's gonna be um, a way to help identify right here. It's that patch, it's empty. Then I haven't, I don't understand why, but I haven't seen them here. This particular site, they are definitely out there. I can see them down the street. So I'm gonna show you what you're probably gonna see. Um, probably the bodies of water that they are are further recessed, you know, not, we're not allowed to go into all parts of the Great Swamp. So that's the male Eastern Amber wing. His wings obviously are, are amber and look at the reddish um, terra stigma he has. I'm just gonna say stigma, who cares about the terra part? Stigma. <laughs> and there's the female. Um, similarity is look at the abdomen. Look at the markings going down the abdomen. Look at the markings on her. She also has the same color uh, stigmas, but she has little bars, patches there. Then, now why is this dragonfly, does anybody know why they're in an obelisk position? Do you think on a summer's day, like when it's 90 degrees, they could overheat? So, if they were lying, if they were perching like this, their whole body is absorbing all the sun. But if they throw their abdomen up the air, up in the air, they've got the wind going around them and less, um, less of their body is exposed to the temperature. So they're cooling off. That's what they're doing. They say sometimes they might do this in mating, but I've seen it on hot days when there's no female around. So I'm kind of guessing, you know, that's why. And then, Paul was telling you that all the wings can move independently. Well, here's a, a gorgeous Halloween pennant showing you his arms, his wings, I'll call them arms because they seem like arms like an octopus, moving in all different directions to control, to control the sun, to control the wind, to stay. Their pennants usually hang on the tip of vegetation and they, I say a pennant flag, I think of a flag flying. So I often see them like this, but they can grab on and they hang. And then again, in a nice wheel, you see that the female's lighter, but they're, they're pretty cool. And then now we're coming to a different family of darners. I'm only gonna show you two different kinds. Here's the common green darner. This is the big guy. When the blue dashers are here, here comes this guy. You'll see turquoise. You'll say, what's that? Whoa, that's the, that's the male patrolling. He wants to see, if, are there any other females around? Are you guys in my way? Am I hungry? Should I eat one of you? Because he is bigger than they are. He could be eating them. So he's got a bullseye and I'm gonna show you from another angle. So you see, it, he looks like he has an eye, like a bullseye on top of his head. He does, those are his eyes and he's got three more. So there he is. And here's a female. She's going to actually have a little bit of the um, turquoise too, you'll see in the next picture, but mostly it's this brick red abdomen that shows off and her eyes are green. Here they are in the water. She's, he's holding on, he wants to make sure he's the only one. She's depositing on those lily pads there. There are those eggs. Swamp Darner was on the boardwalk at the WOC. This is the male, blue eyes. He's got those rings. Darners, again, are bigger. They're, they're flyers more than they're perchers. When they get tired, they're gonna hang like this. 
it's fun to watch them because uh, you could say, okay, you must be tired. You must be tired. Please go on something so I can take a picture of you because I can't take them while they're flying. They're just moving. He was nice enough to land. And there she is. You can see her eyes are green. They're just beautiful. I just love them. So those are the, you had the common darners and the swamp darners, the most common ones you're going to see. Oops, sorry, I keep doing that. And then you have another category, another family. These are called club tails. You see the back of the abdomen. He's hanging. He's got this club-like mm -hmm. appendage. I see this guy every day, um, usually at Kitchell Pond in um, Chatham Township. But uh, he looks like he's smiling. Again, it's hard to think they don't have teeth because they look like they're smiling <laughs> right at you. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have a picture of a gray petal tail. So I imported this via Flickr. That's the gentleman who took the picture. That's also a percher. You can see him hanging there. Beautiful gray, beautiful gray though. And I don't have a picture of a, a twin spotted spike tail. That's another one, it's large. Spike is gonna be for to put the um, eggs into the vegetation, the female and a stream cruiser, you can find this by rivers. Again, I don't have that picture, I wish I did, but I did get a picture of somebody in the emerald family. This is a Prince basket tail. He's not even common uh, looking for an emerald, but because I had him, I actually thought when I saw him that he was a combination between a darner and like a 12 spotted skimmer because he's got the markings here. He's got the big body, he's hanging, but then he tipped his abdomen up. They say it's a, he's called a basket tail because the way the eggs are laid, they're in a, like a basket type. Now we're getting to the most beautiful part of the show, I think sometimes. I love them, but I adore these damselflies too. Same order, tooth ones, odonata, suborders, zygoptera. Uh, it means their wings are gonna be the same. Instead of unequal wings, they're the same. Here's a comparison. So you can see skinny body on the right, wide body on the left. Wings like this for the dragonfly, like this. Now the damselflies, some of them will slightly open up. You'll see in a minute. So those are the main differences. The only, you know, they have the same, same body parts, except there's a different um, appendage for the female paraprox at the end, but who cares? It's, she just gets everything done down there, off there. So that's the, you can see all the same things, except one of the big differences is the eyes. Think of a barbell where you have two bodies here and then a line. That's what the eyes, like they're wide, widely separated. It helps them, this is my favorite thing about them, helps them land on a plant and see around the plant. So it can see what it wants to eat over here around the plant. I mean, is that amazing? And they have slender bodies. They have to control their temperature by the where they are, mostly over there. They have 28,000, still not shabby, photoreceptors in each, in each eye, um, the large eyes. They're widely separated. And when they were um, larvae, that's why I said when you saw the nymph, or the naiad in the water, it had three little appendages. That allows them, that's where their gills are. It allows them to go around the water, it propels them. Whereas the, the dragonfly had to take in the water and shoot it out. This one can use, they are weak flyers. They're not going 30 miles per hour. By the way, 30 miles per hour is the average small bird. Mosquitoes go five, anywhere from 300 to 500 um, uh, Body lengths, per, not bodies, pardon me? The wing beats, right? Wing beats, yes, yes, yes. But also the, yes. But I'm also talking speed. Right, right. Yes, the wing beats, yes. The mosquitoes uh, more. Um, so they're very weak. They're down. You're gonna find these down on low vegetation. Okay, they're not gonna be up high. You, If a wind comes, you know, a storm comes along, that can bring them from here to there, but they're not gonna go very far. I just watch them go from patches of grass to grass. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna grab her behind her neck because his eyes are different, you know? So it's a better grip. There are the three general categories, the broad wings, the spread wings, and the pond damsels. Most of the ones you see are gonna be pond damsels, just like most of the dragonflies were gonna be skimmers. 
This is everybody's favorite. They're out now. They're stunning. That turquoise blue shimmers in the light. That's the boy. That's the boy. Sometimes he'll spread his wings like this, all four of them, and he'll look. So as you can see, he's holding them up high. It's different. There's the female. Can anybody tell me something that the female has that the male did not have in this picture? Here's the male. Oh, somebody who hasn't spoken. There's the male. Here's the female. Yes, the spot on the wings, the terror, the stigmas. And also the body is not, it's iridescent, but not that same. It looks more black than, than blue. And then here, obviously they, they can lay, damselflies can lay on their eggs either in water, but usually floating vegetation. So right now that long blade of grass is being, they're all depositing and the guys overhead gone, any of those mine? Okay, <laughs> any of those mine? You know. <laughs> and these are these are stunning swamp spread wings. They are, I saw these, they are mating right now. Every time I go, I see them. They're gonna look like these finely, fine, delicate sticks floating way down by the water. Um, just I, I don't know, it's, it'll take your breath away if you can you know, see the colors, the metallic green, the brown and all. And here's, here's them in a mating wheel. She looks like she's looking at like, are you really have to take this picture? So I try to give them a little privacy, but I wanna show you what they look like, doesn't it? Isn't she, doesn't she have an attitude there? I think she does. So those are, the, those are some of the spread wings. There's another one that I found, but I'm not going to show you because you're not going to see it here. Now, I always thought, Dorothy, I remember hearing you say bluet. I thought it was bluet. Thank you for saying bluet. These are bluet, some of them. This one, you can see, you can see the eyes, the eye color, the barbell going across that section The, the uh, is, is actually blue. Sometimes it's going to be blue eyes and a black bar going across. The stripes on the thorax and then the markings on the 10 segments. These are gonna be really good clues. Find a picture, you'll find that one right there in the Stokes guidebook. Um, so that's one bluet. They may say bluet, but they're not all blue. Here's an orange bluet. Females, different color, but that's, that's the male. If there's gonna be another orange, Damselfly that you'll see later, but this is where you need to know on the segments. This one has an orange tip right here, but here the abdomen has small, only on like the first or second segments, there's some orange. And there they are mating. So you can see now what the female looks like. There's a fragile forktail, an Eastern forktail. Just wanna make sure that's the male. That's the female. Now, remember before the one, the orange bluet that had orange didn't have this much, not those long and doesn't have, it only has a little down here, not as much on the tip, but it's really here where you notice the difference. Oh, sorry, we went to the blue fronted dancer. Dancer because they're on the water, they're, they're literally skipping around almost. They're very pretty. This, I, I love this one, common, very common. This is a common blue fronted dancer. And then mating, female's gonna look different, but they're hanging on the vegetation. So he, he has spikes on the end of his, um, his legs are femurs, tibias, and then tarsus. That's gonna encompass the kind of foot leg and ankle. And they've got these little spines so he can grab on because he better grab on, he's holding her. Everybody loves this one because purple. There's, there's a violet dancer, different segments, slightly different, but I'm gonna say variable because I know that this is the one description. You see it has a blue tip on the abdomen mm -hmm. and then female, not blue. Now these I found a month ago, I've never seen them. I saw them on the walk right down here, Pleasant Plains Road. I said, what is that small one with the brown thorax, the stripe and a blue tip? Well, turns out it's a blue tip dancer. <laughs> and that, that's, that's the male. There's the female. She's really quite pretty, 
but she's lighter in the in the coloring and in the abdomen. And then here they are um, putting the eggs in the water. So that's it for all of the slides. Um, I'm gonna leave, this is the resource. Uh, some of the books that we use, you can see them up here. Not all are here right now, but you can order them. Um, they're, they're, and they're also field guides, which are really useful. This is my favorite because it shows dragonflies and damselflies and it shows them by the environment, which one's gonna be by a river, which one's gonna be by a pond. It was produced by Mass Audubon, but it applies to the ones in New Jersey. In the winter, I go to Florida. So I pick this up so I can see what's going on in Florida because some are similar, but several, a roseate skimmer, scarlet skimmer, there are others that we don't have here. So just like you travel and you see new birds, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Pardon me? Okay, um, so that's the last slide. So that's the end of the program. <laughs>